Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Gary Schmidt, and I'm a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Our program today is titled Making Federal Buildings Beautiful Again, the debate over the future of federal architecture. This event falls under the auspices, auspices of the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies program here at AEI. I will be the event's moderator, and I'm joined today by four distinguished experts. To save a bit of time, I will briefly introduce our panelists, uh, but do feel free to go to our events page and read uh, about each of our panelists' many accomplishments. Now, in the order that they will, sp that they will speak. Uh, first is uh, Justin Shobo, uh, who is president of the National Civic Arts Society and is a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Fine Arts. Next up will be Michael Lakotis, uh, who is a professor of Notre Dame, at Notre Dame School of Architecture and the former chair and dean of that department. Philip Bess is also a professor at Notre Dame's School of Architecture, and he served as head of the graduate school of architecture for more than a decade. And our fourth panelist is Michael Lewis. Michael is the Faison Pearson Stoddard Professor of History at Williams College and is the architectural critic for the Wall Street Journal. We will proceed in a standard fashion. Uh, each of our guests will speak for approximately seven to eight minutes. And following that, we'll have a discussion back and forth among the panelists. In the meantime, we'll be collecting questions from our viewers that I can ask in our question and answer period. If you do have a question, you can reach us um, by two means. Uh, you can email directly uh, Nicole Penn, and that's N-I-C-O-L-E dot Penn, P-E-N-N, at AEI.org, or you can reach us through Twitter at hashtag AEI architecture. Now, um, Sorry. To start off, um, this was an event that we had planned to hold last spring until the pandemic forced us to shut down our in-person events here at AEI. It was following on the heels of the draft executive order, making federal buildings beautiful again, that made its way into the public domain. Obviously, the so-called news hook that we had for that event has largely gone away. But that was not the only reason or even the primary reason AEI was interested in having this panel. As long as the federal government continues to build buildings or rehab them, we will have civic architecture and in turn questions about what that architecture conveys about our civic life, how it affects our interactions with each other as citizens and citizens with our governing institutions and who and who should have the lead hand in designing those public buildings. These are all important questions, regardless of the status of any particular executive order, and hence why we feel it's incumbent to have the panel today as well. Now, that said, I am struck by the fact that while so much has obviously changed over the past 60 years in our tastes, our laws, our society, the fundamental guidelines for federal architectural designs remain those set back in 1962. Now that either means those guidelines are remarkably satisfactory or it might mean that a debate over what those principles should be is long overdue. Well, I promised our panelists that I'd be a moderate moderator, so I'll leave it at just that. Uh, Justin, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you. I'd like to thank Gary Schmidt and AI for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to argue that we need presidential leadership to reorient federal architecture in a classical and traditional direction. There are four arguments for the reorientation. The first is history. Classical architecture respects and pays homage to our heritage that extends back to the founding of our country when Thomas Jefferson chose classical architecture to embody the new nation's ideals. Starting with the White House and US Capitol, Classicism set the precedent for federal architecture for nearly 150 years. The second argument is the aesthetic one. Classical and traditional architecture tends to be more beautiful and harmonious than modernist designs. Classicism is also far more capable of nobility and grandeur. The third argument is that of symbolism. In the minds of the American people, classical architecture is strongly and positively associated with American democracy. Such architecture provides legible symbols and typology 
It results in courthouses that look like courthouses and public buildings that look public. As Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer once said, quote, classical forms help convey a sense of fairness, dignity, continuity, and equality in a public building, unquote. Fourth, as I will show, the National Civic Art Society's recent survey demonstrates that the American people overwhelmingly prefer classical and traditional architecture for federal buildings. Now, allow me to give a very quick overview of federal architecture. So first, here is the Virginia Capitol, which was designed by Thomas Jefferson, one of the most important uh, first public buildings in the United States. Of course, we have the White House. This is the early drawing for the Capitol building. George Washington um, oversaw the competition along with Jefferson. Here's the second bank of the United States in Philadelphia from the 1820s. Later, the patent office in Washington, DC. The pension building also here in DC. Here is an example of more of a Renaissance revival design in Georgia. In 1901, the Office of the Supervising Architect, which ran um, the design of federal buildings, made classicism the official style. Quote, the department decided to adopt the classic style of architecture for all buildings as far as it was practicable to do so. And it is believed that this style is best suited for government buildings. The experience of centuries has demonstrated that no form of architecture is so pleasing to the great mass of mankind as the classic or some modified form of the classic. And it is hoped that the present policy may be followed in the future in order that the public buildings of the United States may become distinctive in their character. And now to show some buildings um, designed after that. And I should make clear that instead of squelching good design, after this directive, there was an efflorescence of authentic American architecture in which citizens could take pride, including such buildings as the National Archives and Supreme Court, which were built in the quote unquote modern era. Here's the Custom House in New York City. Here's um, a regular old post office done in a classical style. A, um, a less grand federal building in a, um, a smaller city. And uh, in DC, of course, there is the Federal Triangle. Um, the Treasury Department led by Secretary Mellon required that the triangle be classical. Here is the FTC building. Here is a more of a WPA style, it's a federal building and courthouse in Indiana. Here is a traditional style, a uh, mission revival federal courthouse in Texas. Here's a colonial revival courthouse, a Beaux-Arts skyscraper in New York City. And of course, there's the Supreme Court building itself. However, after World War II, the newly created General Services Administration abandoned classicism in favor of modernism. This was formalized in 1962 when Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then a young staffer working in the Labor Department, inserted a single page in a White House report on government office space. He rather ambitiously titled it Guiding Principles for Federal Architecture. GSA would go on to adopt the principles which rejected official classicism and implicitly favored modernism. Favoring modernism was Moynihan's intent as he would explain years later. Indeed, although the principles state, quote, the development of an official style must be avoided, unquote, modernism would in fact become de facto official. Indeed, since the adoption of the guiding principles until the 1990s, not a single government building of any significance was erected that um, is classical or traditional. I should emphasize that the guiding principle state, quote, design must flow from the architectural profession to the government and not vice versa, unquote. In other words, the government, that is the client, abdicated authority. It allowed the elite private sector, which was entirely modernist, to dictate design to the government. This reversal of authority continues today. Federal buildings constructed after the guiding principles were at best undistinguished, but very often ugly and soulless. They epitomized faceless bureaucracy. And here are some examples. 
Here is um, a glass and steel building by Mies van der Rohe, the famous modernist architect. It's a, an inexpressive box. Here's another building by a famous architect, Walter Gropius in Boston. Here is the um, not very inviting entrance. This is the famed or notorious HUD headquarters in Washington, DC by famed architect Marcel Breuer. Two different HUD secretaries called this building 10 floors of basement. And one of them said, quote, it's among the ugliest, I'm sorry, it's among the most reviled in all of Washington and with good reason. One of those HUD secretaries was a Democrat and one was a Republican. Yet GSA has stated that the building is a quote, outstanding modern achievement that exemplifies the primary tenets of the pr guiding principles, unquote. Then we have the FBI building, which I call the Ministry of Fear. Um, and it, recently, President Trump singled out this uh, building for opprobrium. In 1994, GSA created the so-called Design Excellence Program to remedy what the agency, like its clients in the public, perceived to be the abysmal quality of its buildings. The program, which continues today, gives great weight to the judgment and taste of elite private sector architects. Design excellence places great value on quote unquote creativity and innovation. Under the design excellence program, buildings have been designed with multifarious modernist and postmodernist vocabularies, such that there tends to be little similarity or continuity among them. Indeed, what we get is stylistic chaos. Following the intent and track record of the guiding principles, design excellence is heavily biased against traditional design. The program has completed 78 federal buildings and courthouses, yet only six of them have been classical or traditional. That is just 8%. Many design excellence buildings, including those by name architects, have been architectural failures. Some have engendered controversy and some are widely hated. Many of the designs resemble, resemble commercial architecture and many courthouses are unrecognizable as such. The meaning and symbolism of the buildings are also inscrutable to the public and ordinary user. Demonstrating originality and novelty for their own sakes, some federal designs are avant-garde and even disorderly. Furthermore, the buildings often show little recognition of their locale and urban context. Now here are some design excellence buildings. This is actually the prototype for design excellence. Um, it's the federal courthouse in Boston. Here there's a glass wall and here's the entrance. Here's a courthouse in Kansas City. On the side, it has those gun slit windows reminiscent of great society buildings. Here's a federal courthouse by Richard Meyer. It's a glass box in Phoenix, Arizona, which of course makes no sense. The interior is so hot that security guards are allowed to wear shorts. And if you ask me, it's reminiscent of the Panopticon prison. Here's another design by Richard Meyer. It's a courthouse in Islip, New York with a very foreign cone um, at the entrance. Here's a skyscraper in Cleveland, another skyscraper, the courthouse in Seattle. This building in Orlando was extremely controversial. The judges unanimous, unanimously rejected it and wanted a traditional design along with courthouse workers and civic leaders, yet GSA forced this building upon them. Here's a relatively new building in Washington, DC. This is the ATF headquarters by Moshe Safdi, a famous architect. Here's another view of that building. Here's another new building. This is the new US Coast Guard headquarters. Looks very much like a mid-century office park. Here's the courthouse in Austin, Texas, which has been compared to a Rubik's cube. Here's the courthouse in Las Vegas. Here's the courthouse in Miami, sort of reminiscent of a you know, fancy condo building. This is um, the very disappointing US mission to the United Nations, which has very little architecture whatsoever. Courthouse in El Paso. Courthouse in Cedar Rapids, you know, might resemble a pharmaceutical headquarters. Here's an ordinary courthouse in Montana, a new glass box in Los Angeles by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. 
This building in Salt Lake City, the courthouse, um, is pretty notorious. As you can see from the cover of the Salt Lake City Weekly, resistance is futile, how Utah ended up with a board cube for a federal courthouse. Here's a new courthouse, relatively new in Oregon by Tom Main, sort of looks like it's coming apart. Here's another courthouse by him, this one in San Francisco, some kind of alien spacecraft about to shoot a laser beam at you. Here's a close up side view of the building, the interior, which looks like it's already been hit by an earthquake. This by contrast is an example of an alternative of what we could be building today instead. In fact, this is one of the rare examples of a new classical federal building, the federal courthouse in Tuscaloosa. Now, how can I say that this is precisely the sort of building the American people want? The National Civic Arts Society recently completed a visual survey conducted by the Harris Poll of 2000 American adults. The survey found that 72% of Americans prefer classical and traditional architecture for US courthouses and federal office buildings. The poll found a widespread preference for tradition among all demographic groups, including age, gender, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. The survey results were also strongly bipartisan with tradition being favored by 70% of Democrats and 73% of Republicans. And to show some of the results from the survey, here we have a question comparing the HUD building on the right to um, the EPA headquarters on the left. And the EPA headquarters, the Classical building was favored by 81% of the people. Here's that Waco, Texas courthouse on the right, Mission Revival, which won 60% to 40%. And here is one more Classical building um, paired up against a, a Pay Cobb III courthouse in Indiana. Thus, I conclude that given the overwhelming support for traditional design, were President Trump to issue the executive order, or something like it, it would be one of the most bipartisan things he has done. Nothing could be more democratic than giving the people what they want. Thank you. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, special thanks to Nicole Penn and to Gary Schmidt for their efforts and to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting this event. So we've been gathered here to discuss the future of federal architecture. On the one hand, this is in the shadow of the president's uh, draft of an executive order to make federal buildings beautiful again, which explicitly demonstrates a preference for the classical style. On the other, we are also asked to look beyond this particular instance and try to imagine what ought to be. The question of what the future of federal architecture follows decades of building with few exceptions in a manner that many, if not most, lay people find hostile to their senses and sensibilities. The recent Harris poll reinforces that perception. The buildings of the 60s and 70s are cited as examples of the misalignment between what the general public desires and those who determine what public architecture looks like and continues to this day. One might consider the point that there is in fact an official orthodoxy in architecture. This orthodoxy appears to exclude traditional architecture in most cases involving federal or public buildings resulting in the lack of a level playing field for traditional architects who are competing for public works. Most contemporary federal buildings are in fact banal and reflect much lower aspirations than have been set forth by their more heroic avant-garde cousins. The sad truth is that much of what is called modern architecture appeals mostly to architects and not ordinary citizens. There are exceptions to be sure. But the reality is that the post-war period has not produced a built environment that is sustainable, beautiful, accessible, or even meaningful to the vast majority of people in this country. And I might add the rest of the world. One need fly over any part of the planet to witness the sprawl of ground scrapers and other structures that have no architectural or cultural merit. And in fact, threaten our natural environment on many levels with a building culture that is based on consumption and waste. 
Nevertheless, proposing to mandate classicism as the official federal architecture, whether limited to the District of Columbia or not, potentially reduces an entire architectural philosophy to a style. And indeed, if we speak of classicism as a style, it becomes a shallow regurgitation of simple nostalgia. Nothing wrong with nostalgia uh, per se, but it's not an effective means of rationally making a persuasive argument. Classical architecture embodies a dedication to principles of community, resilience, and beauty. Classical architecture in its many forms, in whatever culture it is found, is about elevating the principles of construction to a level of art that carries with it the symbolism of a nation, state, city, or community. Classicism raises the best aspects of a tradition and synthesizes them into solutions for the present, carrying them forward as an inheritance to future generations. Done well, it is an inexhaustible source for inspiration and creativity. Classicism is about the relationship of architecture to nature, and through that relationship makes visible to us the shared building traditions of the world. It reflects the evolution of the art of building and the art of living together justly with a common purpose as reflected in our public institutions. Designing classical buildings for the modern age though is a complex process. It requires knowledge of construction, world cultures, the history and theory of architecture and urbanism, as well as aesthetic judgment. Aside from the tactical and ethical concerns of any official architecture, I worry that the quality of the architecture without the necessary knowledge base will lead to a diminishing standard of what good buildings are all about. The failure of a top-down approach was clear to me when François Mitterrand proclaimed the avant-garde was the architecture of progress. In doing so, he implicitly dictated the public architecture of France. That edict did not succeed in generating cityscapes of inspirational buildings or public spaces. Rather, it brought about an overscaled and impersonal environment that outside of the accepted mainstream of elite architects generated a worldwide building culture of poor imitations that created mediocre and soulless environments. The claim that classical and traditional architecture is a better way of building and expressing our public identities needs to be more broadly and, and, and it needs to be more broadly and deeply understood if it is to become the preferred architecture of the federal government. Assuming that public art is subject to the same degree of dialogue as would be expected in any democracy, I fear that creating an official uh, architecture without a public discussion and consensus will lead to several undesirable outcomes. First, any short-term gain could become a long-term loss as those who have long believed that classicism is the architecture of an authoritarian past will have last seen their point made. Nothing in fact could be worse for the classical cause than to be reinstated by the perception of fiat. Second, without training in the language of classicism, unlike the early part of the century, Principles of good construction, the, res the relationship of buildings to the city, the resulting architecture could potentially be of lesser quality if it were developed over time than if it were developed over time and with dialogue. If we care about our cityscapes, our cities and our buildings, we should strive for an even playing field for architects to compete for public works. That is not in question. But we will also need to address the issue of architectural education to ensure that there is in fact a diversity of approaches to the education of the architect that includes traditional and classical architecture. And as I included in my op-ed in the Washington Post uh, uh, last year, the, uh, the future of federal architecture should rest on the outcomes of a real conversation about what people want and need from public buildings. Federal buildings are a physical manifestation of the nation's ideals and aspirations Built correctly, they should last for hundreds of years, inspiring future generations by bearing witness to the timeless values of justice, equality, beauty, and the common good. Daniel Patrick Moynihan did produce the first set of formal recommendations for the GSA in what became known as the Guiding Principles. And Moynihan at the time was very clear in his beliefs that the development 
with an official style must be avoided. And I think he had no doubt that he, uh, he had no doubt that and recognized that democracy is a messy enterprise. And if we short circuit that public conversation about the most symbolic expression of our nation's founding principles, our federal buildings, we will have faltered in our quest to form a more perfect union. So the future of federal, archi the future of federal architecture should aim to generate and elevate the discussion on public buildings, but also level the playing field. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Philip, you're up next. Trying to share. Can you see it now? All right. Um, this gathering has been prompted uh, by a draft presidential executive order um, leaked to Architectural Record Magazine last February, proposing, actually proposing to restore a capacious Greco-Roman classical humanism as the privileged architectural aesthetic for all new federal buildings in Washington, DC, and for most new federal buildings nationwide allowing regional differences as appropriate. I would have worded the draft executive order differently, but support its general and limited propositions with respect to federal architecture. It is, as one of the most eloquent supporters, uh, one of its most eloquent supporters described it, quote, a salubrious leash proposed for tax funded architects given to chasing fads, end quote. <clears throat> The draft executive order caused an immediate firestorm of protest from our reigning architectural establishment. In turn, the draft executive order has been defended by the National Civic Arts Society, of whose advisory board I have until now been a silent member. It may surprise non-classicists to learn that there, are hard, that there is hardly unanimity among classicists, so much so that sometimes classicists exercising their prudential judgment won't even take their own side in a fight. But classical humanist architecture and urbanism need bulldog defenders such as the N NCAS, since in the fight for beauty in the public realm, classicists are as David to the contemporary modernist architectural establishments Goliath. I therefore note that the draft executive order by virtue of its mandated public reviews inserts at least a little bit of democracy into what is currently a completely hermetic bureaucratic operation that annually spends hundreds of millions of dollars guided by a standing set of vague 58-year-old uh, advisory guidelines that are neither statutes nor federal regulations and are well worth revisiting. Nevertheless, it is surely a large part of the heated professional opposition to the draft executive order that it was issued by this particular president, which must be acknowledged because one of the points about government buildings that needs to be made is that they are inherently political, um, but not necessarily partisanly political. There is indeed partisanship in the conflict between the competing worldviews of classical humanist, modernist, and hypermodernist architects, of which I will speak shortly. But for most of American history, dating back to the pre-1950s era when classical architecture for civic buildings was normative, that has not been so. There may not be a dozen Americans alive today 
who either know or care about the politics of Pierre L'Enfant and Charles McKim. But there are scores of millions of Americans of all political persuasions who have registered and continue to register competing political opinions in the generous public realm of Washington DC's classical humanist architecture and urbanism bequeathed to us by L'Enfant and McKim. Presidential administrations are ephemeral, durable and beautiful buildings are not. The debate about classical buildings for federal architecture, therefore, is not primarily about the legitimacy of the Trump presidency. It has rather become, and increasingly so, about not only the legitimacy of the United States of America, but the legitimacy of Western culture. Let's see. Okay, how do I advance this? Here we go, all right. I wanna discuss the political, but not partisanly political nature of architecture by starting with a proposition I probably too rashly call Bess's first law of architecture and urbanism. It goes like this, architecture always symbolizes power and aspires to symbolize legitimate authority. What do I mean by this? Building is a willful act of symbolic import. The symbolism sometimes intended and sometimes not and all architecture expresses the power of its makers and their aspiration to legitimate authority. This is true not only of individual buildings, but also of public spaces, indeed of all human settlements as artifacts. Their very existence requires or required power in the most elemental sense of the word. More than this, however, human beings attach moral significance to our buildings and landscapes. Legitimate authority is that moral more than mere power, more than the human capacity to will something and make it so. Legitimate authority is power wed to moral virtue in service to a shared ideal. In the realms of architecture and urbanism, aspiration to legitimate authority entails an ambition to unite beauty with goodness and truth. The act of building has metaphysical implications. Specific political meanings of buildings, typically multiple and also subject to change over time, are neither inherent nor unimportant. Moreover, one can temporarily set them aside in order to discuss the authority of architecture in terms, in terms of what um, I will call architecture's internal objectives, that is the goods it seeks in terms of its own self-understanding. What makes architectural authority legitimate within its own self-understanding and frame of reference? The answers to this question vary according to classical humanist presuppositions, modernist presuppositions, and contemporary hypermodernist presuppositions about the nature of architecture and the nature of reality. Classical humanist architecture's goods its complex telos have historically been defined in terms of the durability, usefulness, and beauty of buildings in right relationship to each other. With these characteristics, and especially beauty, understood as objective goods. Indeed, it is a core and distinguishing contention of classicists that the nature of beauty is objective, that it can be, that it can be described, and that beauty in the public realm matters. It is also the case that classicism's complex goods in some way simultaneously represent, aspire to, and participate in some larger cosmic order, the yearning for which constitutes a kind of transcendent utopian, utopianism, partially, but never completely realizable in this world. As a byproduct of these complex but holistic sensibilities, classical humanist architecture and urbanism, because it was pre-industrial, and built with locally sourced, low embodied energy building materials was also sustainably green without even trying. Classicism has also had a long time to refine its capacities for architectural excellence across scales and in modes both austere and fancy. There is good reason it became the preeminent language of civic architecture in the modern world. The Industrial Revolution and the rise of modernity had shaken classicism's metaphysical foundations and modernism's 
ideological presuppositions are different. Modernism is in many ways an anti-classicism, the architectural equivalent of the French Revolution. Though modernism shares with classicism both a teleological structure and a set of moral and aesthetic ideals. Nevertheless, modernism has not proven itself capable of a civic architecture as rich in detail and extensive in range as its classical predecessor. And this I think is because modernism is a single intellectual and ideological error of three sorts, metaphysical, anthropological, and constructional. Metaphysically, modernism's utopian horizon is imminent rather than transcendent, and hence both subject to empirical falsification and susceptible to, author to authoritarian temptations. Think urban renewal at modernism's unprecedented scale. Anthropologically, modernism, unlike actual human beings, is all hope and no memory. And constructionally, because in so many places, modernism was ideologically committed to modern industrial methods of construction, it often did not result in durable buildings. And it surely did not, perhaps could not, foresee the environmental catastrophes that modern industrialization would bring and in which modernism remains complicit. I do think that in a downsizing economy, modernist architecture as an aesthetic tradition has a future as a niche market. But as a living intellectual tradition, I think there is no doubt that mod is dead, done in by historical events, even though it lives on as a default habit of thought in large quarters of the architectural profession, the banality of which is the purpose of my accompanying slide. But as Nathan Glazer has put it, modernism has gone from a cause to a style. The result of the death of mod has been the rise of hypermodernism, which is essentially modernism shorn of modernism's confident consensus and moral and rationalist agendas. Put another way, hypermodernism is modernism unmasked. It is subjectivism, relativism, and individualism writ in and at the scale of buildings and cities. Hypermodernism is the architecture of the global economy taking as premises certain modern material conditions and construction practices, and therefore certain aesthetic possibilities that follow therefrom. It is a nihilistic and frequently narcissistic therapeutic exercise serving various crony capital masters of the universe for the purpose of reconciling atomized individuals to their lonely place in the global economy. The idea that either contemporary modernist or hypermodernist architecture and urbanism are somehow more conducive to human flourishing than classical humanist architecture and urbanism or better suited to diversity in either architecture or human relationships is pretty funny in a grim sort of way. Moreover, today's progressive hypermodernists should not kid either themselves or us. Modern construction is on a collision course with progressive environmentalists and climate change, not to mention the economic reality of expensive, high maintenance and unloved buildings that don't last very long. I don't expect hypermodernists to easily abandon their architectural ideology in the face of environmental, economic and aesthetic objections. But I don't think there is any doubt that both now and going forward, the classical metaphysical realists have the better arguments. And if we survive, sooner or later, we'll have the better buildings. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Philip. Uh, Professor Lewis, you're up. Okay, as soon as Philip takes off his screen. What do I have to do to do that? <laughs> stop, yes. Ah, stop. Gary, thank you for organizing this. It's nice to see all my colleagues here. Gary, I'm afraid you've organized a mutual admiration society. So let me see if I can bring in some, a few negative notes, friendly negative notes. Let me concede at the outset that there is something outrageous about basing the buildings of our modern world, the world of space travel and the human genome project and Einsteinian relativity 
to base our buildings on those of the Iron Age, basically 2,500 years old or 2,000 years old in the case of the Maison Carré. To base, to base our buildings on temples of Jupiter and Artemis and all those other squabbling tenants of Olympus, it is charmingly preposterous. And those who wish to do it have a lot of explaining to do, which they've been doing. But now if classicism is just a style, it is dead because all fashionable styles eventually grow fuddy-duddy and die. So dead styles are dead as the zoot suits of the 1940s or the bell bottoms and platform shoes we all wore in the 1970s. But classicism obviously is not so much a fashion, but a language and languages have the capacity to grow and evolve and remain the same. And what is it that the language of classicism speaks of? Well, it speaks of construction. For all the prestige of the Parthenon here, its engineering is remarkably rudimentary. It is straightforward post and lintel construction, uprights carrying a horizontal beam, strictly limited by the largest stone that could, be, that could be wheeled into place. It is essentially the same engineering system used by the Druids who built Stonehenge. But there's a difference. In the Parthenon, every one of its parts has been shaped and modeled and sculpted to express what it is doing. The nervous lift of the columns, the outward swell of the capitals widening like a catcher's mitt, to clasp the resting beam above, which is all blatant strength. This is the achievement of classicism, to take the brute facts of construction and make them beautiful. That's an achievement, and there's another achievement, and that is in formulating the architectural language of democracy. This is in Sicily, near Syracuse, and these are the ruins of a bulletirion really the world's first building devised to serve deliberative democracy. It's a kind of inverted theater of semicircular form, which permits each speaker, not on the stage, but in the semicircle, to rise, to be seen, and to be heard. So it's a theater of reasoned debate and public persuasion. And of course, this is the ultimate source of our democracy, not simply the institution, but actually the architectural form itself there, Latrobe's um, original capital building. And so the language of classicism suits the reality of democratic institutions. But there's another test that a language has to pass. To be expressive, you should be able to inflect it, to manipulate it, its individual units. Gram grammarians call them morphemes, the, the, the smallest bearer of meaning to inflect them to do different things. And classicism can do a great deal. It can do majesty, as we've seen. It can do seriousness, it can even do swagger, and it can do tragedy. But the problem with the self-concocted invention of a private language is that unlike these buildings where we know the manipulation of the, under, of the underlying grammar, we don't know exactly what it is that a self-invented architectural language is trying to say. Although we heard a nice theory about the, what the FBI building might be trying to say. So when the, the edict uh, was leaked to the press, the, the possibility of, of a mandate decreeing classical architecture for federal buildings last February, uh, there was an explosion of furor, hostility, indignation, and a kind of baffled rage in the New York Times. Uh, I think the New York Times case might have been stronger if they didn't try to bolster themselves by showing examples of non-classical civic architecture. This was, this was the chief illustration, the uh, Salt Lake building that we saw um, previously. My personal position is sympathetic with my three colleagues and friends here. I have a tentative but cautious sympathy to the classic cause. And let me give you some of my reservations. One of my reservations, my principal one, 
is because in the last century, we have seen a lot of classical architecture mandated by government decree, and it's not pretty. This is the Soviet embassy in East Berlin, and it's only one part of a long oppressive promenade of Soviet classicism. This is the Stalin Allee, the Stalin Allee, which was the central boulevard of communist East Berlin. It's, it's a chamber of classical horrors. Take a look at that portico below. Talk about weaponizing Greek columns, that little, that little Doric afterthought there. But if the Soviets have no monopoly on bad classicism, Gary, you've got it right there in Washington, as we've seen. I would nominate, we've seen a number of bad examples. I would nominate one bad classical example. This is the Rayburn building of, of 1965. One heroic marble packing crate of a building that employs all the parts of classical architecture and tablature columns, even gracious balconies, but moves them about at random haphazardly on the refrigerator magnet approach to architectural composition. Now, buildings like this tend to discredit the classical cause. So there is something very appealing in Moynihan's doctrine of 1962, quote, that design must flow from the profession, um, from the architectural profession to the government and not vice versa. Now that is an elegant aphorism, but I wonder, is it true? Is it universally true? Because if you think about it, it's completely ahistorical. Design must flow from the profession, always from the profession to the government. Well, that's predicated on the notion that the architectural world is always equally productive, never stagnant, always uniformly creative, and that all a government agency has to do is lean back and tell the profession, give me the best you got. Now, I think that was a reasonable proposition in the 50s and 60s. Modernism gave us some gems. You might not like Edward, Edward Durrell Stone's embassy in New Delhi, India, but it conveys classical values in, in a modern language. And of course, Louis Salk's, uh, Louis Kahn's Salk Institute is, is the finest example of the heroic axis in the, in the, in the 20th century. Um, but these things worked because in the 50s and 60s, modernism was a serious movement motivated by high ideals, a high caliber of cultural confidence, and above all, a common sense of purpose. So I ask, is that the case today? Since the disintegration of high modernism was consummated about two generations ago, architecture has moved away from from the concerted effort of the 50s and 60s, desperately to find new inspiration, at first in theory, then in high theory, and today, no theory whatsoever. Our architectural world, as you can see, is dominated by the cult of the celebrity architect, whose values are, come from the world of commercial culture. Now, these architects are marvelously stylish, but like all things in the world of fashion, they do not convey value, let alone common value, which is why when they try to make civic memorials, they invariably falter, as Frank Gehry's Eisenhower Memorial. So it's all very well and good to say that design must flow from the profession to the government, but must government always defer? Must it always be passive? Cannot it sometimes act, I'm asking, as an enlightened patron by means of example, by judicious patronage, and in the process maybe help invigorate a languishing architectural culture. Because architecture over the past centuries, as we know, is always galvanized by active, intelligent, strong patronage. The stronger the patron, the harder the architect must work, the better the building. Yes, classicism is the architecture of the Iron Age. But in the 20th century, we've seen that it can be built out of modern materials to serve modern function. And its highest values, the sublime, the sublime here Boulay's hypothetical library, gave the point of departure for one of the most modern classical things in Washington, which is, we take for granted, we forget, 
is classical, and that is the, the Washington subway system. So should the government mandate classical architecture as the style for federal buildings? I am sympathetic. I'm uncertain. I'm willing to be convinced. So that's it. Thank, thanks, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for wonderful presentations. Um, uh, let me, <laughs> some of the comments, uh, well, all the comments reminded me that, you know, um, many of you may not know, but I used to work for Senator Moynihan. Um, and so I had the pleasure of uh, uh, both his office was in the Russell Senate office building. Um, my committee office was in the Dirksen Senate office building. And then right before I moved to the White House in that other majestic building, the, the old executive office building, I had an office, committee office in um, Hart Senate office building. Um, and in Moynihan's uh, own office, we had this joke, which was uh, the Russell Senate office building was uh, built and designed when America began to think of itself as a civilization. Uh, Dirksen was designed and built when America decided it could send out for pizza. And that heart was built and designed when people were going to the mall to do all their shopping. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, we all had a we all thought we were junior architects uh, when you worked for Moynihan. If I, I, I don't want to cut off the discussion between us, but I, I just throw out one uh, short question to begin with. If, if one had to take a look at writing a new executive order, um, and let's just assume that the current executive order um, gets put to the side for a bit. What kind of executive order, what kind of changes would you make to the executive order? Um, presuming you think that the 62 guidelines are somehow not sufficient, uh, which may not be the case, uh, but if you had to sort of think through what, it, what the principles uh, for a new set of guidelines would look like, uh, what, would you, what would you highlight? Uh, and let's kind of go in reverse order. So I'm gonna ask Michael Lewis to, kick us off if you can. I wasn't expecting that question. Boy, <laughs> boy. I, I, I wanted to hear from Justin first because I think I may be the most skeptical of, of the group. The, the one thing I, I would say, which isn't exactly an answer to your question, 50 years ago, it would have been utterly impossible to make any decree mandating uh, classic classicism as a style because there was no cadre of competent architects who could do classical buildings. Today, today there is. So I would think that, that, that such, a, uh, such a mandate should not be a private clique addressed to them. It should be expressed broadly enough. It might not even have the words Greco-Roman antiquity in it, but it, it should be loose enough that classical values or classical style, so it, it would give, a, it would give a good shot to those architects who could make a good classical building, and there's a number, but it wouldn't begin by, by limiting ourselves to the to those 20 architects. Yeah. Okay. Professor Bess. Well, anybody, go ahead. <laughs> well, so, um, I think that with respect, well, one of the characteristics of um, of classical architecture um, is that it grows out of a kind of vernacular architecture that's related to construction. And, uh, and its history is one of um, uh, working in a particular geographical location, uh, generally with a scarcity of means. Um, uh, one of the reasons that Athens had um, such great, um, you know, marble temples is because there was some local marble. Um, uh, nearby. Um, and, and so um, one of the thoughts that occurs to me with respect to rebuilding a culture of, of, of durable architecture and also that is also, um, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, uh, low embodied energy and environmentally uh, sustainable would be to um, uh, uh, make a preference for uh, bearing wall buildings um, uh, for federal buildings uh, throughout the United States and limit it to, I should say, bearing wall buildings or whatever sort of um, locally 
um, uh, source materials might be available. I mean, if you're if you're in the North Woods and you've got heavy timber available, then that would be that would be something. But but the idea would be to try to, to encourage local cultures of building uh, uh, throughout the United States um, uh, and and in traditional <coughs> methods. I would say that for the for the um, for the capital, um, you could you could resource. Um, uh, materials from all over the world because it's the capital. But that for um, uh, you know local and regional architecture, maybe you say um, bearing wall buildings that uh, have to uh, the materials for which have to come from with a hundred within a hundred mile radius or a two hundred mile radius or within state lines or something like that that would actually um, encourage uh, a local culture of building. Um, that would be similar to the local cultures of building that that created traditional architecture, except here it would be a self limitation that we, we would be imposing upon ourselves rather than, um, you know, a, a, an actual um, pre modern limitation. Professor, Professor Lika, this? Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with uh, you know, Phil and Michael. Um, you know, I think a performance based code, if you will, would be would have been the way to go. Uh, to think about enduring this. Uh, I think limiting, presenting classicism as a style and purely as a style, as, 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 a, as a historical style presents all sorts of problems. I mean, you, first of all, you inflame the profession. You, th there's no basis for a conversation. So if the purpose of the federal uh, mandate would be to elevate federal architecture, I think a performance-based uh, proposition would have been helpful. Um, durability, uh, uh, scale, urbanism, uh, dealing with the city or the environment that it's in. Certainly a building that is in a town is different than a building that is in a big city, different than a building that is in the countryside. But those are uh, conditions that, have, that are being decided by local climate, local culture, uh, the, the local grain of the environment. So all of these things, I think, uh, will have needed to be outlined in a little bit more general terms. I would have probably not included the naming of specific architects in, in such a, uh, 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 an executive order. Um, I, I think it's problematic for all the other architects that it's not naming. Uh, what about Julia Morgan? Uh, you know, what about others? Uh, what about regional architects like John Guamim, um, which go to the points that were made previously. Um, so you, you, get your, you get yourself into a hole, which is, I think, one of the problems that the executive order, the, the draft of the executive order had, is that it, it didn't embrace the, the infiniteness of classicism and of traditions and of an architectures that have an inherent optimism to them. And, you know, Classicism has been the architecture of democracy, but it's not about its stylistic uh, limitations. It's, a, it's been about its worldly and historical aspirations, which is why when the Republic started in this country, there was a common view about all these ideas. And it was easy to make such an executive order or a, a, an official character or approach to architecture because it was shared with the vast majority of people. If you were an architect, uh, you could design a building in a, in a few pages and you would have the craftspeople that would be able to execute the, the iron railings, the, the carpentry, the cabinetry. You didn't have to draw everything, but there was a whole culture that embraced it. And excellence was everyone's responsibility, not just the architect. Mm -hmm. Today, we have a far more simplistic approach to the making of buildings and without a public realm to help that and shared purposes, and we are left to, as I think Phil very quiet, very, very elegantly said, to private interests and private uh, aff affectations uh, in, in our buildings. So I would have preferred going, just to, to sum up, I would have preferred a more performance-based approach uh, to, to such a thing that would in fact lead to one to traditions because traditional architecture is in fact an ecological approach. It is in fact a civic approach. Thanks. Justin? Well, I would first point out that in addition to the poll, 
that I mentioned. I mean, the results are so strong that it's just obvious what the American people want. And I and this is the sort of thing where everyone already knows that ordinary people prefer classical and traditional architecture. It's not any great surprise. There are also academic empirical studies finding the great divergence between how ordinary people and architects judge buildings. There's one study that found that not only do architects judge buildings differently, they cannot even predict how a lay person will judge a building. So part of the problem, a huge part of the problem here is that there's a great divide between the architecture establishment and what ordinary people want in buildings. Thus, I think it would not be controversial to the great majority of Americans to have an executive order that says that there should be special regard for traditional and especially classical architecture in the design of federal buildings and courthouses. I don't think that, I mean, of, of course, the architecture establishment will be extremely upset at that because this is a threat to their hegemony. That's part of what, what's been going on here is that for a long time, the architecture profession feels that they are the only rightful judges of public architecture. But as we can see from the poll, and as I believe any other poll would show, that's not what ordinary people want. And thus, it would be completely appropriate to have a federal um, executive, um, an executive order reorient federal architecture. But to mention one other thing that you know hasn't hasn't come up here is I do think it would be also absolutely appropriate to require that future future federal office buildings in Washington D.C. be classical in design. Um, classicism is the character of Washington DC in the same way that modernism is the character of Brasilia, the, the, the modernist city that was built from scratch in the, in the 1950s. The American people, when they think of Washington DC, think of classical buildings. They do not want more buildings that are brutalist or in other modernist styles. And thus there would be nothing wrong with requiring classicism um, for DC. You know, um... You reminded me when we were talking. Um, so I've been to Berlin quite a bit. Um, and I, I was uh, back in government days, uh, went to Bonn. And of course, they moved the capital to Berlin after the East Germany uh, became part of uh, democratic Germany. Uh, and so there's an immense amount of new building that went on as, as, as everybody moved their embassies from the Bonn area to Berlin and Berlin itself got rebuilt. Um, and there's an immense amount of really attractive modern architecture. I mean, there's some really outstanding examples of modern architecture. Um, but I must say, when you have a whole city full of modern architecture, you do get the sense it's sort of like Skittles um, after a point. I mean, it, 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 you don't have a sense of any kind of gravity to the place um, other than the rice rag, which I think they, they re, you know, put the capital uh, glass dome on it and it's really quite striking and quite lovely. But, but I, I would note that even in Berlin, the new, new construction near, near the Brandenburg Gate is classical because the Brandenburg, Brandenburg Gate is so iconic, they didn't want to class, clash with it architecturally. And I would also point out regarding the design of Washington DC and presidential leadership in general, is that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, very strongly directed the classical design of Washington DC, even with his own hand-drawn sketches. A lot of this story is not widely known, but he even designed a plaza, um, it was never built, to be built near the National Mall that had a, a circular colonnade. He designed the elevation for the National um, I'm sorry, the Naval Medical Center. He chose the site of the Pentagon. Um, maybe most importantly, it was he who got the Jefferson Memorial classical design built. That design, uh, and it was, it was FDR's favorite design, that design uh, was opposed by the entire architectural establishment. The head of Harvard's Graduate School of Design called it an egg on a pantry shelf in the middle of a geometric Sahara. But FDR opposed modernism and supported classicism, and he saw to it that the Jefferson Memorial was built. I think that is perfectly legitimate presidential leadership. So I didn't want to inter interrupt the discussion between you all. So um, feel free to, you know, have at it and, and ask each other questions if you would like. And if there was any points that you really wanted to draw out or, or uh, uh, take exception with. Well. Um... <clears throat> 
you know, when modernism first became sort of the lingua franca in the post-war period, let's not forget that the world was coming out of, you know, years of horror and uh, it represented an optimism, an, uh, a, 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 the philosophy of optimism. I remember my grandmother holding me in, our, in the sill of our window in Athens and pointing to the bullet holes across the street, telling me that we were gonna rebuild the horrors of the past would never be repeated. Little did she know that the horrors were yet to come in terms of what happened to Athens. Uh, but um, we live in a very peculiar time and we have since the second world war. There is little consensus on, mu on much of anything. Uh, there is a diminishing public realm. The public realm is what kept us together uh, through all, st all strata of society. And without a public realm where we can all compete for ideas and, and push, our, push, our, push our, our thoughts through and, and come to a, a reasonable consensus, we'll never be complete consensus. It is hard to, through fiat, dictate what's going to happen. Franklin Roosevelt may have very well have designed, you know, much of many moments in DC, but there was a culture that also supported it uh, through the craftspeople, the, uh, the architects, uh, you know, there, there, was, there was the last gasp of a culture of tradition and the hegemony of modernism as has been talked about, it was almost complete at that point. In fact, the sculptures at the, on the, on the uh, National Gallery because of the objections of all the architects. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think that we have to really present a thoughtful, um, a, a, a more thoughtful approach to how we change the world, how we change the built environment and I think part of it begins with education and part of it begins with perhaps a, a broader discussion. I think polls are great, but as we all know, they're not always predicting you know, what, what will happen. Others? What, I do, go ahead, Michael. I think you're about ready to. Yeah, the, the uh, interesting to hear Michael talk about the, the bullet holes in the wall in Athens. We, we got hit by a kind of perfect storm with World War I, the great col collapse of belief in the goodness of our own culture, shattered. Modernism arises in Europe, not in the United States, which, had, which hadn't been shattered to, to the same, same degree. But then comes the Depression, 1929. So when America goes, embraces modernism, it coincides with the, the worst catastrophe that ever hit the American architecture profession. Well over 90% of architects thrown out of work for a decade. And you have a great loss in all the things that, that, uh, that Michael and Philip have been, and Justin have been talking about, craftsmanship and the, the office knowledge. That there was a, a great deal of the, almost the way an orchestra, all the musicians carry on living knowledge passed on to each, each new cohort. But that got swept away from architecture and those kind of commissions. So modernism represented a, a kind of architectural mass distinction, extinction, like the thing that took out the, the dinosaurs. So it's, it's taken a long time to get back to a position where there could even be the kind of, I, I love the idea of building basing buildings on materials from the state or within a certain certain radius. But there the, the government would really need to play an active part in, in encouraging the, the, the recreation of this craft knowledge and office knowledge of classicism. I have a, a question from a, some, some, one of the uh, participants online. Uh, very basic question. Um, let's presume that there really was a kind of thumb put on the scale for uh, classicism in architecture. How many firms actually could pull it off in a way that would be uh, um, effective and do what we what one would want it to come from, you know, what classicism would produce? Um, in other words, are there enough architects out there to actually do this? Well, um, uh, let me take a crack at that. I, I think there are, you know, when I first came uh, to Notre Dame nearly 30 years ago, there were maybe a handful of 
practices that were uh, designing classical buildings or traditional buildings. Uh, I think today there are hundreds. Uh, they may all be at the scale of producing a federal building, but you have at least, you know, uh, s several tens of, of firms that could cope with that scale of building. And, uh, you know, we, we the, the university here, we, we give a prize every year to an architect of, uh, who, who is uh, dedicated themselves to tradition and, and classicism. It's called the Driehaus Prize. And we have a very long list. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, it's an international list as well, but there's a lot of people here, a lot of firms uh, that are really doing amazing work and getting better. As the, as the crafts have been reinvigorated, uh, as from, from masonry to carpentry to, to iron work, to steel work, to everything, uh, that, 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 gr that group is expanding. The follow up on that. Is, are there courses actually in civic art architecture and architecture schools? Uh, well, at um, um, at Notre Dame, yeah. I mean, there's a. Um, I mean, let's. I'm trying to think. Let's see. So there's several schools. Uh, well, Notre Dame has had a classical, ha, has had a program for which uh, Greco-Roman classicism has been foundational for for 30 years. Um, so we've probably graduated more than a thousand um, undergraduates um, with that education. They've all um, they've all spent a year in Rome. They don't all become classicists, but they're all educated as classicists. Um, one reason I think that that's important um, is that um, uh, arguably the most productive uh, period of American architecture, say between 1880 and 1940, um, I like to you know tell my students that it was a time when there were virtually no bad buildings built. Um, in, in multiple styles, uh, styles, right? Because uh, in, in multiple vocabularies. And, uh, but the, but the, that um, almost all of the practitioners um, either w uh, had, had you know, gone to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts or they worked in offices um, where they were educated in, in Ecole de Beaux-Arts methods. So they were, they were um, it, it, was a, it was an eclectic period of time that produced great buildings that was really grounded in a classical um, uh, Beaux Arts education, and so I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for, you know, these uh, our, our graduates to have the opportunity to kind of step up and, you know, have the opportunity to do these kinds of buildings because we have some very fine um, graduates who who uh, are doing really good work, but it's, uh, you know, of, of necessity, it's, uh, you know, it tends to be smaller scale or it tends to be domestic or. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that actually motivated me in all of this was that I thought it would be um, uh, a welcome opportunity for our graduates to have a chance to, to do more significant classical buildings. Yeah, I, th I mean, I'm not, I, w I had a very more specific question of mine, whether or not there are actual courses in public buildings. In other words, uh, you know, sort of, you know, here's how you go about thinking about building a civic building, um, as opposed to incorporating classical elements into a into a building. I'm just curious whether or not that's, you know, some part of a curriculum that wouldn't you would want to have if you wanted to resurrect um, uh, a better public building process. Well, I, I not to just to build on what Philip was just saying, you know, I don't think that there's a course, at least at Notre Dame, there may be courses in other schools that are just on public buildings, but you know, I, I think that one thinks when one thinks about the city, one sees a spectrum of public buildings, commercial buildings, residential buildings, kind of a, a spectrum of typologies that make one understand what a public building, a sacred building, and a private building all have uh, in common and what they have uh, that differentiates them. But I don't know that we have a course. Uh, I think that one just tries to understand the city, the idea of the city. The broader idea of the city, and from there one begins to understand architecture. Well, and if I can add to that, I mean, there, there are multiple studios that are being offered uh, in the curriculum at any uh, any given semester, and and so the choice of projects is uh, typically determined by uh, the professor, with with, you know, with a couple of exceptions, where a group of professors will will take a, a class through a series of exercises. And, and so there are frequently, um, there are public buildings that, that are given. And then 
uh, every student does a, uh, a thesis project um, uh, in their final semester. And most of them um, are doing some kind of religious or, or civic building, many, many of them, if not most of them. And um, um, so it, 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 it's, there's not a course per se, but there's, there's a lot of opportunity um, uh, at Notre Dame to do that kind of thing. And, and there's some other schools that are starting to um, teach a, um, you know, a, a, a classical curriculum, Catholic University in, in Washington, DC, um, uh, Benedictine University in Kansas, I don't know where else, Michael. Um, um, well, the, um, other schools have experimented or have strands, uh, you know, Yale had a strand. Uh, right. And, and there are courses, and, and there are courses that are offered at the Institute for Classical Art yeah. and Architecture, and so it's um, the the it, it's expanding beyond Notre Dame, I, I will say. Now, maybe not fast enough, but but it is expanding. Yeah. I I have a question for my fellow panelists who are the most skeptical about the leaked executive order. Would it be okay for the president to weigh in on on the design of specific buildings? one at a time. So for instance, if there's going to be, I mean, there is going to be a new FBI headquarters, uh, probably in Washington, DC. Can he have a say in that? Because I think back to, I mean, the, the founding fathers themselves handpicked the design for the White House and the Capitol building. In Britain in the 19th century, the British parliament required that the competition for the House of Parliament result in a Gothic or Elizabethan design. In India, President Nehru required that the design of Chandigarh, the provincial capital, be modernist in design. And I already mentioned Br Brasilia. All, these are all cases of democratic leaders making determinations of public architecture. Yeah, interesting, Justin. I, I like the premise. I don't think it could work with this particular president. It's a paradox because of all of all the inhabitants of the Oval Office, he's the one with the longest record as a patron of architecture. He's the great builder of buildings. And, and it would be nice in, a, in, a, in an unpolarized America to see him wade in confidently. I, I think one of the greatest moments of art, of art in this country, patronage of the last century plus, was Teddy Roosevelt handpicking Augustus St. Gaudens to rethink our currency, the most beautiful coins we've ever had. And that's the power of that's the power of of the Oval Office that you you can call public attention to it. I don't. Uh, I think the president's in position to, to make a case. I, I don't think with this president the case will be listened to, alas, or that he might even care. I, I don't know. Other than despising the FBI building, I don't know. You 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 might have a better inkling. Does he have any yearnings towards classicism? Then goes back to you, Justin. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, obviously, from the leak of this executive order, there is interest in the White House in the subject. And one thing that's worth pointing out is um, there, President Trump has appointed three people to the US Commission of Fine Arts. The Fine Arts Commission is a seven member body appointed to four year terms. Um, we are the aesthetic guardians of Washington, DC, for lack of a better term. And um, the three appointees, including myself, are all champions of classicism, the other two being Duncan Stroik and James McCreary. So I think that is indication that the president does care about classical design. So one of the, uh, when, I, when I think about circumstances of, you know, dealing with complex issues that are, that are uh, quite divisive, um, for me, um, I, I think that um, one of the one of the great models was the um, President's Commission on Bioethics under under um, uh, George W. Bush, that was headed by Leon Cass. Uh, it was I think it was a 17 or 18 member group that included uh, you know people uh, across the spectrum um, with respect to bioethical issues, and it always seemed to me, uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of that had to do with with Leon Cass. Um, that it, it seemed to me that it was a kind of model um, uh, kind of uh, colloquium for thinking about these, these complicated issues. We could do worse to find something like that. Now, I don't know, I don't have a sense that, that George W. Bush, um, I, I, I think he, he, I don't know how, how much he participated in it, in it. I know that 
Uh, his first decision before 9-11, um, his first major decision had to do with, with stem cell research. And there was a kind of Solomonic decision, right, that, that came about that was directly influenced by, by that, um, um, you know, by, by that uh, body. And I would like to think that uh, for at least some presidents uh, who, uh, who don't have um, uh, what a uh, knowledge or, or, or record as, um, you know, as, as patrons of architecture, that that, that, that might be how, um, you know, how, how you would actually solicit um, a wide spectrum of, opin of opinion. I mean, I think right now um, there's, um, there's not a, a wide spectrum of, of opinion um, in the GSA. And, um, and to the extent that, that this president is trying to um, expand that, I, I, think that it's, I think that that's a good thing. Uh, but whether he, you know, whether he should be directly involved in it, I think there's um, um, some, some reason for anxiety about that. Um, but, um, but there are other models. I would just jump in as a colleague of Leon Cass's at AEI. Uh, he's the master of the seminar, mm -hmm. uh, which is the ability to actually get people around a table um, to discuss and deliberate in ways, uh, particularly if you're a gif gifted seminar leader, to get them basically to where you want them to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So uh, I do have a, another uh, question, a couple of questions, but uh, this one I think is particularly worthwhile. Um, not that the others aren't. Um, this question is, when discussing classicism as a style, I think it needs to be asked, can modernist architecture commu communicate what federal buildings ought to communicate? Is it more or less capable of communicating um, the democratic spirit, the rule of law, et cetera? I, I, I would be interested in, in my colleagues' take on this. I happen to like I.M. Pei's National Gallery. It's, it's furiously modern, but you can make an argument it's very classical. It, Mason rebuilding large, generous spaces, a clear axial order, and, and the most classical of values is repose. And that's what happened in the 20s with Paul Cray's strip classicism, a new kind of classicism emerged. I, unfortunately, we're not, we're at a time architects aren't building in that way, but I, I what, what do you think, Philip, Michael, Justin, about I.M. Pei, that there is a kind of modern classical hybrid? So my, my reservation about that building and, and sort of modern classical hybrids re really has to do with construction. The construction is about, modernist construction um, is about uh, frame construction and the separation of enclosure, the enclosure of the building from the structure of the building, which uh, makes it inherently less durable. Um, I mean, the, the, the East Wing of the National Gallery famously has had to have like a, a 90 to 100, 100 million dollar um, uh, facelift uh, less than 40 years after it was built. Um, and part of that, actually Nathan Glazer uh, in his book, From a Cause to a Style, um, um, sort of covers what some of those problems are with, with um, modernist um, construction and uh, monumental buildings. It's that, that often it involves um, using experimental materials, um, which was the case, um, you know, of, uh, in, in the case of the East Wing. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's one of the reasons actually that I think that, that uh, the normative building really ought to be um, bearing wall building for, uh, if, if the objective is durability, which I think is, uh, I mean, it's, it's one, of those, one of those legs of the classical you know, uh, stool. Um, and and, um, and it's, a, it's, it's a post and lintel and you know, bearing wall kind of construction. Um, that that um, you know that that I think is is um, um, intrinsic intrinsic to, to classicism. I think, I think modernism is capable of making monumental and actually quite beautiful buildings. Uh, I think Edward Durrell Stone's uh, uh, embassy in, in in India was uh, is an example of that. Um, I may have some nostalgic appreciation for the U.S. Embassy in Athens, for instance, by Walter Gropius, which is a very classical building in some respects, not classical in others. Um, but I, I think the problem is when we look at architecture as a style, as, as sim it, we see it as an expression of our own individual uh, personalities, rather than seeing it as a civic art where, you know, durability, scale, 
the city or the environment that you're dealing with plays a role in shaping that building. So, you know, you, you can look at the world's traditions and you can see commonality everywhere. It's all about, uh, you know, conservation of materials, but yet celebration of aspirations. And to the extent that modernism would be able to, whatever the modernism means anymore, I don't know what it means anymore. I mean, it's, we live in such a, in a at a time of everything is uh, undecipherable and un, un, and you cannot label things anymore. You, you, you put you you name something and it all it immediately disintegrates. So, um, I, but I yes I mean can concrete can steel can glass, uh, you know, yes they are capable of producing meaningful buildings. The Singer Building in New York City, glass and steel or glass and iron. Um, you know, so yes it's capable. It's a question of where is the will in the architect in the culture, in our cultures around the world to create these meaningful environments. You know, top-down works for the short period. It doesn't work long-term. And uh, whoever, I forget who showed the, uh, the Karl Marx Halle in, uh, in Berlin. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, Michael, you did. Um, but that's really a horrible place. And, you know, and that's where it left unchecked left with, un with lack of education, with a lack of culture. And culture is both top down and bottom up. And without those two forces acting on buildings and cities, we will never have a meaningful environment because by the very nature, it is this undulating pendulum between the private and the public. And when the public disappears, the private reigns supreme, you get chaos and towers of Babel. If you only the public domain then there's no ability for uh, opposition and challenge from the private. I, I just don't understand this idea that top-down direction never works. I mean, Washington was designed by Pierre L'Enfant. The Macmillan plan is what created the National Mall and the Monumental Corps as we know it in 1901. You know, Emperor Louis the Thir um, uh, Napoleon III created Paris as we know it. And I think that was pretty successful. Um, so the idea that we need, and also top-down leadership can encourage the schools to change, can encourage the profession to change, and therefore we can have change in both directions from the top and from the bottom. Yes, it's true, but don't, let's not forget that in those times, the, whole, the entire culture supported these efforts. I mean, from the people that made the buildings, the people that designed various aspects of them, there was not a single part of society that opposed this approach to building, not a single. I mean, it was everyone was 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 focused on moving in that direction. Well, as I suspected, uh, an hour and a half is actually not long enough to actually <laughs> solve uh, this uh, discussion, or not even. I mean, it's it's a discussion that will continue for sure. Um, but we've we've almost run out of time. Uh, if, if anybody has a, a final comment they want to make, uh, please do. But before we do, I just want to thank you for uh, participating in the panel and also just for the excellence of uh, the comments. Uh, and again, this is a, a discussion um, uh, and a debate uh, that I think is worth carrying on uh, because our, our public buildings are too, too important to uh, just you know let it be sort of something that appears in, as a leaked document and then a few you know New York Times op-eds or uh, editorials. Um, it's a serious issue and, and, uh, and I hope um, people think that we've taken it seriously with the discussion today. But again, any final comments from you all or please go ahead. Well, well I would just say uh, again, that the, the great cultures of building that we know were built under conditions of scarcity and limitation. Um, to the extent that we are a, a culture of abundance, and the, there's some debate about you know, whether we in fact uh, will be a culture of abundance for a long time. But if we are, I think we're not gonna get back to um, uh, a kind of quality of building, at least for our public buildings without some kind of self limitation, um, some, kind of, some kind of artificial um, limitation um, that that may have to come from above. It may come, you know, from within the profession. But but um, the civic realm is not helped by an ideal of no limits. Okay. Michael, Justin, Michael. 
Unmute. The situation today reminds me very much of the Gothic revival. In 1800, the Gothic was a frivolous style, style for garden pavilions. 40 years later, as Justin said, it was the principal style of the major building of state. What happened in the intervening years, a great public education program by the writings of Pugin, John Ruskin, the novels of uh, Sir Walter Scott. I think there's a case to be made for classicism, but it's gotta be carried at an educational level through literature and a, a tremendous amount of persuasion. Top down alone doesn't work, but with persuasion at a literary and Absolutely. journalistic level, it needs to be a concerted effort. I just, to, to follow up on that, I mentioned the House Houses of Parliament. One interesting thing about the debate was both the Whigs and the Tories wanted Gothic or Elizabethan, but the radicals wanted classicism. And the Whigs and the Tories opposed it because classicism for them meant republicanism and Britain was a monarchy. Good. Well, again, thank, thank you all for joining us today. And I thank uh, the folks that emailed questions in. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Uh, but again, uh, thank you for joining us online. Uh, all the best, guys. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you, thank you Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good Thanks to see everyone. you all. Bye-bye.